Thanks for tuning in to the Trap House Podcast. Now a quick word about our sponsors. We have Duke Traps. Check out duketraps.com. Duke manufactures over 40 different models of cage traps, coil spring traps, long spring traps, and body grip style traps. Also, my personal favorite, they have the Duke Dog Proofs. They come powder coated, uh, perfect on the line. Check out duketraps.com and you won't be disappointed. We have J3 Outdoors, maker of the Hags Bracket, all American made products. Check out their website, j3o.com, and you will not be disappointed. They have everything from your bait holders, your spring clips, your tail hooks, the universal locks, the list goes on. Especially if you're a water trapper, you want to check this website out. That's j3o.com. We also have Top Lot Stretcher Company with us. Check out their website at toplotstretcherco.com. Top Lot Stretcher Company handles all your wooden stretcher needs, along with pelt handling supplies and trapping supplies. Check out their website at toplotstretcherco.com. And representing all the girls in the trapping world, we have Trapping Girl Inc. with us. Check out their website, trappinggirlinc.com. They have awesome apparel for the females. There's also kids apparel, uh, lures and baits, uh, things you could use out in the field. Check out their website trappinggirlinc.com and there's only one true way to start out the trap line in the morning and that's with a nice hot cup of coffee from traplinecoffee.com check out their numerous collections they have trap line blend a kodiak blend and my favorite a cherry red blend all available at traplinecoffee.com also be sure to check out weeby knives that's weebyknives.com they have skinning knives fleshing knives all your fur handling tools Check out WeebyKnives.com. Need a place to sell your fur? Check out Grownwold Fur and Wool Company. They're the largest and most experienced direct receiver of wild fur with over 50 plus years of experience. Their website is gfwco.com. And last but not least, Hoosier Trapper Supply. Check out our website, HoosierTrapperSupply.com, home of the top dog predator bait and jet fuel predator lure. We got all your trapping needs, trapping scents and baits, deer scent, and apparel. Check out HoosierTrapperSupply.com. To help us defeat the Colorado hunting ban, go to SaveTheHuntColorado.com and check out the raffles. There's a mountain lion hunt and taxidermy raffle and a Gunworks rifle package. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this podcast, and thanks for listening. Listen. (laughs) To live amongst these creatures is part of the fabric of why we live in Colorado. It's a life of adventure, fulfilled by the opportunity to share just a moment with the wild creatures that call this landscape home. Colorado's wildlife is abundant and an irrefutable success story rooted in science. We are the Coloradans for responsible wildlife management, and we're committed to defending the North American model. The key to wildlife management is balance. If we didn't manage wildlife, our populations would see instability. It's our responsibility to help manage our wildlife populations, whose habitat we live, work, and recreate in, in order to ensure a balanced and sustained future. The North American model of wildlife conservation utilizes hunting, fishing, and trapping as both a funding mechanism and a tool for managing sustainable populations. Colorado's regulated harvest of 78 game species allows for the management of all 961 species on the landscape. Without hunting, there is no funding mechanism, no balance, no science. But this model that has worked for over a century is under attack. Extreme animal welfare activist groups are working to circumvent the authorities of Colorado's General Assembly and distinguished biologists. Their goal is to end hunting across the country, and Colorado is in the crosshairs. The assault on the North American model starts by removing the regulated harvest of mountain lions and bobcats in Colorado contradicting the scientific findings of two long-term research projects by Colorado Parks and Wildlife biologists. This regulated harvest creates sustainable populations of Colorado's big cats, balanced with healthy populations of deer, 
and reduces conflict with humans. Management is absolutely necessary. Prove it in CPW's own findings that there are no real-world examples of success with just letting lions exist with humans without thoughtful management. This attempt at ballot box biology would also use a non-existent lynx harvest as a red herring, a species protected at state and federal levels that was reintroduced and now recovering thanks to the success of the North American model. Make no mistake, this is the foundation of a larger goal with national implications. Though this attempt targets the harvest of big cats, it specifically prohibits trophy hunting. It's a thinly veiled attempt to codify something that can be used to end hunting altogether. Understand what they mean by trophy hunting. Intentionally killing, wounding, trapping, stalking, or pursuing a mountain lion, bobcat, or lynx. Intentionally pursuing and killing. Isn't that hunting? This sets a precedent to substitute any species they want. This ban is being pushed by those who refuse to acknowledge the benefits of hunting simply because they don't like it. This fight can be won, but we need your help. If you truly care about sustainable wildlife populations, listen to the science. Listen to what's happening on the landscape. Listen to the facts. The Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management is proudly partnering with conservation organizations across the country. We're united in this cause and welcome any and all in defense of science-based wildlife management. All right, welcome back to the Trap House podcast, everyone. We got a great guest today. Dan Gates is with us all the way from Colorado. Thanks for joining us, Dan. You bet. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I spent a lot of time in Indiana in my life, but I haven't been there for quite some time. But uh, at least I'm there in spirit and mind right now. <laughs> well, um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there's a lot going on in the world uh, right now. So we just want you to hatch it all out for us. Basically, in a nutshell, we'll get to that. But you, you're, you do multiple things. We should probably cover that. You're on the FTA board, Protectors of America board, right? Yes, sir. Colorado uh, Colorado. for responsible wildlife management. Yep, Coloradans for responsible wildlife management. Okay. <laughs> which, yep. which, um, I guess just to give a little context here, you guys are basically fighting for the for your um, lives out there in terms of outdoor uh, related activities, particularly. Um, the deal right now is a ballot initiative for mountain lions and bobcats to be taken completely off any hunting or trapping um, activity. So they'll be completely protected if this ballot initiative goes through. And that was that was basically the reason for the Association Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife. Media. Yeah, when, when we formulated CRWM back in 2017, we did it um, because I'm still the, the president for the Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters Association. And, and while we were making significant strides on the trapping and predator hunting side, uh, you know, you, and you guys know you're trappers, um, trying to garner support from the other acronym hook and bullet groups, the conservation groups is sometimes tough. Yeah. And, and while they might support trapping, sometimes they don't want to come out and say that they support trapping or, or they, or they, they do it in such a way to where you're not really sure if they support it or not. And if you ask them for any money, you might not ever get any support out of them. Uh, so we formulated CRWM because of things that we were dealing with on the landscape. And at the time, we knew that we would likely have a new governor, which we had a pretty good inclination of who that might likely be. And we got him and we got his spouse. Um, Jared Polis is the governor and Marlon Reese is the spouse. Um, and, and Marlon Reese is a animal rights extremist. And Jared Polis uh, is a animal rights activist in some degree, probably not as extreme as what his spouse is. Uh, but we felt that necessary to formulate, for one, because of what we thought upcoming administrations, and for two, because the trapping community had a hard time coalescing and collaborating with many other groups. And if people need to know, this is in a state that we really don't trap. I mean, we already we have already lost trapping per se. Uh, for avocational purposes back in 1996 under a constitutional amendment ballot initiative at the time. And and so we can trap 
avocationally on private or public land with cage traps. And we do some 30-day exemption permits on private land only, no public land, with some foothold traps, some body gripping devices, and some cable restraint devices. And and we fought tooth and nail to be able to turn around and modify those regulations over the course of the last eight or nine years through the, through the Department of Ag and Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So all we have, if somebody wants to get a fur bearer's license, we don't have a trapping permit. You get a fur bearer's license, all you can do is, is use cage traps. Uh, if you have damage, beaver damage, coyote damage, and whatever, you can get a 30-day permit. But that's one 30-day permit per calendar year per piece of property. And so if you got beavers in the spring and coyotes in the fall, you're SOL. I mean, you get you used your permit. And so that's the constitutional amendment. That's the and we lost that back in ninety six by fifty two to forty eight. My running of a wildlife control business before and since then uh hampers our efforts, but you figure out ways to um maneuver and adapt. And with cage traps, we did so very effectively. Matter of fact, I mean, on a personal note, I was one of the first dumbasses that decided to really start picking up cage traps and utilizing them for a large scale avocation. And if you look back in the history books, uh, my son and I were, were the first two that actually kicked out videos, uh, DVDs and VHS videos about cage trapping. And people told us, oh, you're full of shit. You're full of shit. You can't do that. You can't do that. Matter of fact, I went to commit conventions and we were set up and for a variety of different reasons for our store and stuff. And and some of the big names that were there that were big time coyote trappers and big time bobcat trappers, you know, they, they, this was like I was some uh, snake oil salesman coming from the West <laughs> in this in this wagon that I was selling these these concepts. Well, as I told them, if you're forced to use something, you figure out a way to adapt to it. And uh, there was a lot of caged manufacturers that came up and then we gave them spe specificity on on the design and the size and the structure and the collapsibility of them and so forth. I'm not taking credit for the cage trapping world, but, but there wasn't anybody doing it in the West to the degree that we did it to start with. And, uh, and I harvested a lot of bobcats and I harvested a lot of other stuff avocationally while still running my damage control component of my business, uh, that my son then runs with me now. And, uh, you know, you just learn to adapt. Well, it's kind of hard to adapt when they're going to ban everything, when you can't have anything. Right. So on this, these initiatives that are coming up, um, particularly the first one, which is, they call it Initiative 91, but they call it a trophy hunting ban. But it's not a trophy hunting ban. We got the trophy hunting language out of it. And it's a, it's a hunting ban. And the, it, would, it would take away, it would prohibit, restrict the harvest of mountain lions or bobcats in any way, shape, or form unless it was a damage type issue or human health and safety issue, which is allowed now that we could still do that now. So it's not like they're giving us anything. They're just allowing us to continue to do what we have already done through um, protection of livestock and private property and so forth. So if they get, if they, if they're successful on this, uh, you're going to see some significant alterations in, in language throughout the country. And the reason I say that is because it's a statutory definition. They are defining what trophy hunting is and nowhere in the United States can we find in statute where trophy hunting is defined. And so what, what they'll define it as trophy hunting as intentionally killing, wounding, stalking, pursuing, or entrapping a mountain lion or a bobcat. And the reason that's important is because typically game agencies make regulations. They don't make statutory definitions of anything. That's up to the legislature. <laughs> if they statutorily define trophy hunting when it really specifically says hunting it can easily set a precedent throughout the country on a variety of other species or methods of take or seasons or whatever and that's the thing that we're trying to get people to fully understand yeah it says mountain lions and bobcats but that's the low-hanging fruit sure. you won't be able to use hounds you won't be able to use tracking collars or devices and if it's in statute, it's easy to turn around and say, and the people would say that we're full of crap when we say this, but if it's in statute and you can't use hounds with electronic collars and tracking devices on mountain lions or bobcats because they banned that, well, why should we be able to allow that for upland bird dogs and waterfowl dogs and rabbit dogs and stock dogs and coon dogs? Why should we be able to allow it? Because it's easily defined in statute. We're just following statute. And that's the easiest way that they can turn around and tell the general public. 
the, the conundrum there is more often than not, the animal rights extremists, they go to other communities around the country and they go, look at what they did in California. Look at what they did in New Mexico. Look what they did in Pennsylvania. It's easy to do this because this is what it is. That's with just them referencing regulation. And then when it becomes ballot initiatives where the people vote on it or legislation where the General Assembly has it or maybe a Parks and Wildlife Commission, those are different interpretations about precedent. But if, if it's statute, huh, you want to turn around and open up a can of worms, you could you could literally take out mountain lions and put in bighorn sheep. You could literally take out bobcats and put elk or mallard ducks or coyotes or skunks for that matter. I mean, the, that's a little on the extreme side, but that's how much lunacy is involved in this. And when the average guy says, ah, well, I don't hunt mountain lions and bobcats. I don't trap. I don't use hounds. When you explain that to him and say, you read this and you interpret this from your perspective, more often than not, they go, wait a minute. Does that say what I think it says? And you could turn around and look back and go, yeah, it does. Now, you tell me where a court or a judge or an attorney will not interpret it the same way. How do you define it when the people of Colorado have already spoken to make that the statutory definition? That's the underlying element when we get into this hunting ban. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought this was going to be a, a fun conversation, but you kind of started getting depressed, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Follow me around for a day. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, obviously. Yeah. You get your hands full. So ultimately, this goes to a, as a ballot initiative. So this fall, November, you guys will vote. Yep. The public will vote to decide whether or not. On this one specifically, mountain lions and bobcats, which yeah. can easily carry over to whatever else. So, yep. um, that's that's basically the bottom line to this whole whole deal, correct? Yep, that's basically basically the bottom line. We started the process, and not to give you a, a play by play, but but since September twenty second of last year, we started the process, and with with the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management, which I'm the executive director of, from the first of October until roughly the 1st of February, we spent over a quarter million dollars. We already raised that money previous to that because of the association that we created. That quarter of a million dollars went to attorneys and campaign strategists to fight through the two initial ballot initiative, the proposals through the Secretary of State, the Title Board, and the Supreme Court. Those are things that are allowed to us through the Colorado Constitution. So we were, we were able to, to defend what we wanted to get. Now, we can't stop it at that level unless we prove that it's more than a single subject in the in the title and so forth. And there's, there's a lot of rules that you have to comply with. But anyway, we got to a point to where we forced their hand on one end. We forced the opponent, the, our opponent's hand on one end, forced them to withdraw even a more nefarious uh, title, which was Initiative 101. They withdrew that because we had the funds, we had the ability, the legal team, the resources to be able to, push them to the limit because there's timelines that you have to go on. Mm -hmm. And for any state that doesn't have ballot initiatives, it's, it's hard for them to comprehend, but there's 26 states that do have ballot initiatives like this. Yeah. And so if it's, if, if they're successful here, more often than not, that they, they try to end up going to some other state. Well, you know, Arizona has this method. New Mexico has this method. Utah has it. Wyoming, Montana, most of the Western states. We're finding that a lot of the Eastern states don't but some of the Midwestern states do. And some of that's by a referred measure through the General Assembly. Some of that's where people turn around and don't have to do anything but get the signatures. Some of it is going through what we have to do here, where we have a referred measure through the gen General Assembly, where the people then still have to get the signatures. Yep. Or we have it to where they just turn around and say, I want to ban Coors beer. And then they can come up with some lunatic flipping deal. I don't want anybody to have bulldogs. I don't want anybody to wear black hats. Uh, you, I mean, that sounds stupid, but that you can put the wording in there. And if you can get it through the secretary of state on the title board and get the signatures for it, you can put it on the ballot. Yeah. Um, so we, what we have to deal with is, is primarily that issue. However, uh, you want to see some, you know, here's some other stuff. In Denver this year, there's two ballot initiatives for the city and county of Denver. They can vote on the mountain lion and bobcat 
ballot initiative and the next ones I'm going to tell you about, which one is a fur ban to ban the sale of fur in the city limits of Denver. And the other one is a slaughterhouse ban. There's one slaughterhouse in the city limits of Denver. It's been there for about 90 years. And it, it's a, a, a lamb slaughterhouse. It's the largest lamb slaughterhouse processing facility in the Western United States. The animal rights activists don't want that to survive. They want to kick it out and they want to make sure that nobody else moves in. But the language in the ballot measure that those city folks can do, can vote on, it talks about processing. It's not defined what processing is. So if somebody wanted to process a deer in their garage or do 15 of them for their buddies, could they or could they not do that? Yeah. In, in the ex explaining terms of trying to figure out, theoretically, if you went and bought a half of a beef, and brought it back to your house to cut it up. It's not really defined whether that would be allowed or not allowed because of the vagueness of this. The fur ban, for instance, talks about natural fibers. Beaver felt hats are a natural fiber. Fly fishing material and fishing lures are a natural fur fiber. Native American accoutrements and accessories and artwork are natural fur fibers in some cases. They would be able to manufacture them and sell them, but you have to be indigenous to be able to buy them. So when you go to a powwow like what we got in Denver, Charlie, you and I deal in a lot of different things in our lives. You could turn around and take your goods, but you couldn't sell it to a Native American because it's got to be a Native American to be able to sell it and buy it. Well, I tell you what, I don't know how many powwows you've been to or Native American art festivals and stuff, but I haven't seen very many Native Americans buying everything from Native Americans and a lot of Native Americans not buying everything from Native Americans. So it's the hypocrisy that they brought to the table on three different ballot initiatives. One has to do with food. One has to do with fiber. One has to do with conservation and avocation. And they are attacking every single thing that they can possibly attack in the state of Colorado. And I'll give you a list of things that you just de it would depress the hell out of you when it comes to gun legislation and coexistence bills and, and the crap that comes out. And you just think this is not the state that, that I grew up in. Yeah. This is not the ideology that I grew up in. This is the extremist mentality that can and will spread throughout the United States faster and farther if we allow it to. And if they grasp some place like Colorado, the centerpiece of the West, the centennial state, if they get what they want here after we've already lost some of the other stuff, the statutory precedent will be set. And I guarantee that they won't have to spend any more time in Colorado. They can move to whatever state they damn well please, yeah. whether they have a ballot initiative or not. Mm. Depressed yet? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that should be a wake up call for everybody. If you haven't already been woken up by this stuff, you know, and it, it kind of amazes me, Dan, I'll, I'll run into guys and and yeah you know, i mentioned earlier i mean we're kind of preaching to the choir for generally the people listening to this but obviously most don't know all the ins and outs of what you guys are dealing with in colorado uh but if they're on social media they sure should be seeing some of what you get the cr uh crwm has sure, yeah. got out there but which is you guys are doing an amazing job um with that but it, it still amazes me when i'm I'll tell somebody, well, you know, we had a proposed bobcat season here in Indiana in 2018. They withdrew it in 2019 because of public outcry against it. And they were like, well, what's wrong? What's wrong with they, they were completely clueless that there was even anybody out there that had the perspective that we shouldn't be doing this stuff. And mm -hmm. and um, so, you know, it, uh, hopefully this will educate a lot of people and make them realize how how serious this is and how important what you guys are doing is. I mean, this is, you guys are taking on a huge role, basically, um, front line for the rest of the country, essentially. So that's what it's become, and and it's it's uh it's admirable to see the generosity that's been uh, given to us, and it's remarkable to see the sort of continued outreach. I mean, for 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 anybody that hasn't paid attention for whatever reason at this point, I don't know because you know, look, I didn't even never I didn't never know what a podcast was until December. And I've done like 50 of them since December and 30 th since February. And I and, and on, on some of the biggest platforms that, that could ever be given to anybody. And a lot of that is, it's damn sure not because of my good looks and charm, I'll tell you that. But it's, it's you know, the, the, the message that we have to be able to extend to like-minded individuals in our stakeholder community, in the hook and bullet crowd, in the trapping community. 
I'm 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 a I'm a poster child for this. I've lived in the state all of my life. Um at least all my adult life. I was I moved here from Missouri in 1974. I started working in a taxidermy shop in 1976. And uh I I could tell you that the the growth that Colorado has endured. We had 1.9 million people then in 76 or 77. Then we drew to 2.9 million people by 96. We're at 5.9 million people now. We have we have more population, human population in this state than Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana combined. And we have last year in 2023, we had 84 million visitors to the state of Colorado. And my, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho combined had 33 million. Yeah. Uh, Incredible. Have, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we, we just put wolves on the ground here in December of 23 because of a ballot initiative, which is a different deal than this one, because that was bringing stuff in as opposed to taking stuff out. But it, but it was a controversial enough one to where we were told that we would probably lose that, you know, 68 to 32%. And, uh, and lo and behold, it was 51 to 49. And so the people weren't a hundred percent sold on, should we bring wolves in here or should we yeah. not? But the campaigns that they that they employed at that point in time in 2019 and 2020 didn't think, and I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like I'm putting ourselves on a pedestal or myself. They didn't think like us because we'd already lost stuff. We had lost bear hunting in 92. We lost trapping in 96. We could still hunt bears in the fall by spot and stalk. We can't do anything with baits or, or hounds. But but I we lived through that, and 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 Charlie, you guys, you guys could understand this. But the majority of people that I talk to right now, going through this whole process, you know, I'm sixty flipping years old. The majority of people I'm talking to were not born, or they were in the second grade or less the last time we lost something in the state of Colorado. Mm -hmm. So when you talk to them about a ballot initiative, they go, you know, what what is that? Yeah. Because they saw a ballot initiative to bring something in in 2020, not take it away. And and so there's very few people left that were playing in those 90s that are not so old that they don't want to play, they can't play, they throw their hands up, you know, they, they gave up. Well, I was one of the dumb bastards at the time that I was, you know, in the, it, you know as, as things transitioned, from trapping into non-trapping, um, I saw things happen in the 70s and the 80s because of where I was recreating and who I was working with. And then the 90s came along, and the guys that are my age now or less were running the show. And while I'd maybe not have thought that they did a good job, and obviously they lost, I don't think that they took it to the mat as seriously as what they should have. Yeah, It was trappers. And it was bear hunters. And the thing that we're trying to advocate on this, because I'm a trapper and I'm a bear hunter and I'm a lion hunter and I'm an elk hunter and I'm an upland bird hunter. I'm a fisherman. I've traveled around the world. I travel around Canada. I've, I've traveled around the United States. I'm a freaking sportsman. And I think that our problem in this community today and today's day and age is to not recognize that first and foremost, that we are sportsmen and women. Because every freaking trapper that I know does exactly every single one of those other things. But every single one of those other things don't necessarily do trapping. Right. So if we want to include ourselves into the fight, that's why we formulated CRWM. That's why we turn around and put this together because we couldn't hardly get their logos onto our letters. We yeah. couldn't get them to sign on to our, to our cause. We created CRWM with an umbrella and they're like, oh, Gates. Oh, huh. So, so if we sign on, it's underneath the umbrella. Yeah. So it's not really signing on to the trappers. Yeah. No. Okay. We'll put our logo on there. Oh, do you need any money? We could give you some money because it's the CRWM. It's the Coloradans for responsible wildlife management. And I'm thinking at the back of my head, well, if we'd have done this crap 50 years ago, maybe we wouldn't be in this conundrum yeah. through the trapping community. And and because we have lobbyists at the Capitol, because we're a 501c4, it gave us a different platform to be able to do things, to advocate and educate. And from the advocation side, 
the lobbying side comes into it because the sportsman organizations that we deal with, all the acronym groups that have magazines and fundraisers and free knives and banquets and all the other stuff, they can't do a bunch of what we do as a C4 because they're a C3 and the tax status doesn't allow them to do so. Right. I'm a board member of the FTA. I'm a board member of the NTA. I sit on the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project as the vice chair. I sit on the Colorado Wildlife Council as the, as the chair. I'm the executive director for the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. I'm on the Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters, been the president of that for the last 12 years. I'm on more damn boards and committees and acronyms that most people could turn around and name. And, and every single one of them is for a similar cause. But I turn around and browbeat the hell out of people as much as I can and say, we are sportsmen. Yeah. And if we don't determine and put our line in the sand, then our enemies, our opposition will determine how we are recognized, how we are categorized, and how we are bastardized because we can't get off our dead asses to figure out how we're going to turn around and fight the opposition without fighting internally amongst ourselves. Right. That's really well said. I mean, that's 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 a very important point. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, you look at the pictures behind me. There's there's a lot of trapping pictures in here. There's a lot of critters. This is what I do. This is what I live. I live it, breathe it, eat it, crap it, sleep it. I mean, <laughs> every, everything I do is this. Yeah. But this will not survive at any level throughout this country, in my opinion, if we don't figure out a way to commingle those thoughts and those efforts and those resources and make sure that we are all part of that conversation. What I see out of the Mark Duda responsive management deal, there's 178,000 licensed trappers in the country. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has more than that, more than that in their membership. Yeah. And most of the members that I know that are trappers are members of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Yeah, that, yeah, certainly. Yeah. yeah. So we just have to figure out a way to we define ourselves and we redefine ourselves and we put our mark on the North American model and we start defending that because there is a provision in there about market hunting and about fur bearing animals. We need to turn around and make sure that we plant our flag in the sand, draw our line in the concrete to where it draw to where it dries. We stand there and we defend it. Yeah. And I don't think collectively we've done a very good job of that from the conservation side because we haven't engaged in the fight before the fight came to our door. And our plan is because we were prepared for this is when we are victorious come November, then we can turn around and do something offensively as opposed to constantly getting kicked in the ass and waiting for them to, to make their next move, their next chess move. Right. Yeah. It would, it would be awesome to be on the offense and not on the defense yeah. all the time for sure. So um, Dan, what is the, so what is, I guess without re, um, telling the secrets, what's the big, what you're going to guys going to do a lot of TV advertising. You can do all social media or just all of the, all of the above, just. All the above our, our campaign right now, there's, there's the two campaigns. The wild, the Colorado wildlife deserve better. You can go online and look up wildlife deserve better. That's on social media. And that's um, the website. And that's the, that's the campaign that we hope will be able to message and talk to the target audience, to that 18 to 34 year old crowd between Colorado Springs and Boulder and Denver and Fort Collins that lives within 25 miles of east or west of the I-25 corridor, which is the bulk of our population density. And we, so that's the campaign that'll give the instructional message about why ballot box biology is not a good thing, why science-based wildlife management is the best way to go. The Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management will have a message component to this. But right now, Charlie, we all we've done has been talking to our community, to the stakeholder, trying to educate them on the importance of these issues and these matters, because we can't fight this alone in Colorado. No. We can't. We've generated a significant amount of money. And I won't give you the numbers yet. When we win, I'll tell you how much we had. <laughs> But I say a significant amount of money from multiple funding sources and outreach and the community that has supported us so wholeheartedly over the course of the last four months already that is really stepping up to say, what do you need? When do you need it? How far do you need us to go with it? And so once we get to a campaign, because they're in the middle of their signature gathering process, once we get to a campaign, if they're lucky enough to get the signatures, we will put on an onslaught of an attack 
like nothing ever seen before in the history of the United States when it comes to fighting a ballot initiative. I can tell you that, and I know that Maine has defeated things, and, and Arizona's defeated things, and Texas has defeated things, and Ohio's defeated things. And there's been a hell of a lot of losses at different levels, too. too many. But I can tell you that we've, we've generated 80% of our money from small grassroots contributions from all 50 states, six Canadian provinces, four foreign countries, where people have hunted here, own property here, recreate here, ski here, and do a variety of other recreational opportunities in some capacity. I mean, if you got 84 million people coming here in a year, somebody ought to be able to have some connection to the damn state. But we're getting donations of $5 a week from guys that, on the website. Uh, my wife just today had a, had a check come in for $5,000. Yesterday, we took in $33,000 from over the weekend that came in. Some yeah. of that's $50, some of it's five grand. We had an alligator trapper in Florida in January, sent a handwritten cursive note that was just so hard to read and what he was saying. And he said, I'm never going to make it to Colorado and I'm never going to hunt elk, but I hope there's somebody like you down here in Florida when they come to take gator trapping away. And he wrote a check for 250 bucks. We got people that are doing $20 a week. We got people that are doing hundred dollars a month on the website or sending us a check. We took a money order in yesterday. I wish I had the letter sitting here, another handwritten deal, money order from California. He said, I don't have a lot of money and I'll never get there, but I've seen what they do to turn around and erode and degrade California. And I will never get to Colorado, but I want to help you 50 bucks. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, 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 the outreach from, I don't know if you guys are familiar with go hunt back there. We did a podcast with them and Lorenzo Sartini, the owner of go hunt. One of the owners during the podcast said, we're going to step up. And for every $149 go hunt insider package that you, that somebody buys $149, we're going to contribute $200 to CRWM. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah. Spartan forge for every $20 donation that we get, they were given out a membership to Spartan forge. Uh, you've seen the Renella stuff. You've seen the, I don't know if you saw the Eastman's magazine that came out last Friday, uh, the, the entire belly wrap around the Eastman's sheep edition. Hundred, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of that, and they gave us the front and the back of the nationally publicized magazine um, to help spread the word. We didn't mm -hmm. pay for it; they donated it. Yeah. Uh, the things that we are seeing, I mean, it's just pretty inspirational to see what what is being outreached. Uh, uh, we had a we had an elk hunt that was donated. Uh, Wild Sheep Foundation in January auctioned that elk hunt off at their fundraiser event in Reno. It brought fifty thousand dollars, and before I walked out of the room that night, we had another twenty-five thousand bucks. People see the sense of urgency, but they also see the statutory component and the precedent that this could set. And people are starting to open up their eyes and going, "Maybe we, maybe we need to turn around and help somebody else defend something." Because if that's the case, what happens if it comes here? Who's going to be left? And, and I think that we're seeing bow hunters to come together with muzzleloading hunters, and we're seeing houndsmen come together with trappers, and we're seeing elk hunters come together with deer hunters. Um, I can tell you that being 60 years old and watch a bunch of crap happen throughout the United States over the last 50 years, this is the most inspirational, admirable, remarkable coalescing of sportsman-type issues that I've ever seen or been fortunate enough to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. It's very impressive. I obviously really appreciate everything you're doing, Dan. Um, so in terms of the, the demographic we've got, you've always got that lunatic extreme, whatever, you'll never be able to change their mind, but it's actually a pretty small percentage of the population, I would assume. Yeah. Um, but you got everybody in the middle that can be, yeah. that may not necessarily be into consumptive use of wildlife, but they're generally a lot of them may or may not have an opinion or they're easily educated um you know sometimes it's easier to be against something and latch on to the emotional um side of it which obviously skews uh judgment but that that group you know um that's that's that i think the uh videos that you guys have put together i mean that reaches that group perfectly i think you know it's just um and they don't you know, if you watch that and you, they should be, fortunately be inspired when they go to the, 
the uh, ballot box and and you know the voting machine and they're able to to put that with that and you know it's um i think uh, one of the one of the hardest things to do in, in in our community has not in my opinion not recognized the importance of um talking to the public and and i say this over and over and, and it probably falls on deaf ears to some degree but the conservation community has talked to their members. They've talked to the sportsmen and women. They've talked to get them to buy a membership, up their membership, contribute, donate, go to a banquet, do a fundraiser, do some sort of a conservation effort. I'm not knocking any of that because I'm part of that. But while they're doing that and nobody's been on the ground fighting, the opposition is building up this war chest. If anybody hasn't looked up a 990, which is the tax document on HSUS and see that they've created three or four or $500 million in a freaking calendar year to turn around and take everything that we strive to keep. And we're worried about banquets and memberships for $35 in a magazine. I think there's something wrong with this process. I'm not saying we get rid of that. Cause I think we need it. We better figure out a way to take some of that and put it somewhere else to where maybe we can't come up with $300 million collectively. But right now we're not coming up with $3 million collectively. We're going to change that here. Yeah. We're setting the tone and the narrative and the playbook. And I can tell you what, if, if we don't win, everybody else better watch out because they're, they're going to figure out that they, they stomped a juggernaut, but when we win, everybody else better jump on the bandwagon and say, Hey, can we have a copy of your playbook? Yeah. You got your roadmap because we want to figure out what you've done. And, and I'd, I've already been outreached by by Wyoming and New Mexico and people in the in the eastern states to different levels going, hey, w w can you help us here? What do we do there? What about Wisconsin? Can you do that? Well, first of all, let us finish Colorado first. We, yeah. We've got plans to turn around and, and, and set up a program to help other organizations and entities and states. But that's why we need everybody on this, because this is not a state line deal. 252,000 hunters is what my understanding is that were non-resident that applied in the state of Colorado last year for applied for licenses for one of our big game species, 252,000. They're all kicking in several hundred dollars at different levels just for the opportunity to turn around and apply. Cause you have to have preference points and you got to buy your points and then you have your application fee and you have to buy a qualifying license, which is a small game or a small game fishing license. So you're already kicking money into the pot before you even turn around and put your damn application in. Well, 252,000 people that are non-residents have skin in the game in Colorado without even living here. Yeah. If they want a chance to continue to use their preference points or build up for a trophy mule deer hunt or a trophy elk hunt or a, or a moose hunt or a bighorn sheep or a mountain goat or an antelope, something you have to physically apply for, well, they better help us out because when we're done, if we're gone, who's going to turn around and fight for them to be able to continue to pursue what they want to pursue? Because let me tell you something, wolves and bears and mountain lions eat a lot of shit. <laughs> and we're never going to be able to turn around and hunt wolves here, but we're going to have an expanding mountain lion population and an unchecked bear population in some capacity. And that stuff is not going to help for opportunity and conservation and hunter participation. And pretty soon it just starts to trickle down. And it's hard for people back East that have never been here to understand that, or people that have been here when they go back East and they got 200 deer standing around a, a bunch of feeders on 140 acres or whatever, you might not see 200 deer in a whole season out here. Well, you're going to see a hell of a lot less if we start letting mountain lions eat everything unchecked with no harvest. Yeah. And I think that that's where people, that's one reason why we're seeing so much enthusiasm because that message is starting to resonate with that non-resident sportsman. They're going, oh, well, maybe I should pay attention to Colorado. I've already dumped in, you know, $600 and stuff. And right. maybe I should put in $20 or $50 or $100. Right. I mean, Mike Costello with Howl for Wildlife, which we worked with really hard over the last four months. Mike and I, Charles Whitwam, great guys. John Stallone with Howl. Matter of fact, I'll see him next week at the Mile High Hunt and Fish Expo. And we've got booths, booths set up next to each other. They've really helped us create a messaging deal. But Mike said... If everybody would just give up a box of bullets, the cost of a box of bullets, I had to reiterate, don't everybody send us a box of bullets. 
I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't need a semi load full of bullets out here. Uh, but if everybody sent us a cost of a box of bullets, whether that's you shoot a 300 win mag and now there's send us that box of bullets price because that's less than what it costs you to apply for a license out here. You know, it gets to the point where you're begging, borrowing, and stealing, but hey, we, we need we need to finish our plan. And right now, we feel like that we're in the third round of a 15-round title bout, and we have kicked the crap out of the opponent for the first three rounds. But we've got 12 rounds to go, and we need the stamina and the endurance and the strategy to be able to do that. And to do that, we need the money to be able to make sure that we can talk to that target audience when the final three rounds of that 15 round bout ha happens. Yeah. So while you're on that subject, Dan, where, where can people go to donate to you? Well, if you weren't going to say it, I was going to. So, uh, <laughs> save the hunt, Colorado.com is the primary website, save the hunt, Colorado.com. And there's, there's two things you can do. You can donate or if you want a chance at something, you can still kick in the same amount of money and you can buy a raffle ticket for a mountain lion hunt and a full body mount with a great lion company, the lion outfitter company, uh, Whitaker Brothers and Ovis Wildlife is providing the full body mount. That's about a sixteen, seventeen thousand $17,000 total package. So you can buy a raffle ticket or one or two or three or 20 for that. And then there's also a Gunworks rifle, a 7 PRC, with a high-quality um, long-range scope that was donated by Gunworks Rifles. Anybody's familiar with that? I mean, they, they, they're they the, the, the cornerstone of long-distance long shooting, I think. Mm -hmm. Gunworks Rifles and then Salida Gun Shop both contributed to that. That's about another $15,000 package. So you can buy raffle tickets and have a chance of winning something, and all the proceeds go to SaveTheHuntColorado.com. Or if you don't want a gun chance and you don't want a mountain lion chance or your wife won't let you put a full body mount in the house, then you can turn around and kick in 50 or 100 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever somebody feels comfortable with. Either way, you're supporting it because those two items, the gun works gun and the mountain lion hunt and the mount itself were all 100% donated. Just like that elk hunt that we got 50 grand out of, all 100% donated. And uh, so there's multiple options that somebody do save the hunt, Colorado.com do the donate button or you can, you can do the, the uh, raffle opportunity as well. Okay. Very cool. Okay. I'll put the link in the description for anyone listening. It'll be there. You bet. You bet. But just um, for some educational purposes, what, what groups are the biggest threat to this consumptive lifestyle? Uh, tough question because right now I see some of them feeding off of each other just like what I think some of our sporting organizations have unintentionally done yeah. for membership and you know stature on the landscape and paid positions and, and so forth um, but I'd have to say that any of them that adamantly oppose the North American model of wildlife conservation and responsible wildlife management like what we adhere to, or at least if they can't define science-based wildlife management, and if they're always fighting with whatever game agency there is in the, in the state, whether it's Indiana or Florida or Colorado or whatever, and the other ones that are part of that are the ones that are adamantly trying to impose their re, their I'd say religious beliefs but it's their religion because of of animal rights extremism so I don't want anybody to say that I'm you know mixing religion <laughs> in but it's their it's their religion it's the right. way they believe they it's it's the way they think that that things should be that they, they're trying to change and impose their ideologies through different commissions through appointments of commissions just like what we're doing here, I see where Kentucky's got some things going on and other states have got things going on. If they can infiltrate through the voter elected process with governors and senators and representatives 
to get who they want in specific positions, whether they're elected or appointed or hired or whatever. It's a lot easier for them to capitalize on what they want to try to accomplish. And I use Colorado as a prime example. While we've not been a very purple state, let alone a red state, for about 25 years now, we are damn sure turning about 30 shades of blue right now. And while we've got some good Democrat legislators, the overwhelming majority come from an extremist side, whether it's agriculture, whether it's conservation, whether it's guns, whether it's natural resources, whether that's renewable energy, whatever. they it's, it's no moderation. There's no gray. It's black and white. Us against you. Republicans against Democrats. I mean, it's, it's almost just like what we've done to eat ourselves alive, you know, Bow hunters versus muzzleload hunters and long distance versus upland bird hunters. And I mean, if they would organize like what we're trying to talk about organizing, we'd be screwed. But I think that we could become the most formidable opposition on the planet. I saw a deal that came out. I forget where it was. But with the amount of sportsmen and women in the United States and Canada combined, we would have more of a military taking those two groups than any military in the country, I mean, in the world. If everybody else looks at us like that, why the hell don't the opposition look like that? I'm not saying we call to arms and we go storm the Capitol and wear Buffalo hats. I'm saying that if we rallied our troops and came together and went to a commission meeting and went to a legislative hearing and dealt with our legislators that somebody elected, whether you voted or not, somebody elected, we could be the most formidable opponents on the landscape. Wouldn't it be cool if trappers and turkey hunters went into the Capitol together? Wouldn't it be cool if bass fishermen and bow hunters were in the Capitol together? Because they do a lot of that stuff anyway. It's just the fact that they've segregated themselves because their alliance and their allegiance to one particular organization. Our opposition doesn't care who we are and what we advocate for or what we're a member of. All of their goals combined, even though they have some dissension in the rank and file, all of their goals combined is to take every one of us off the landscape. Every single one of us. And they realize they can't do it this year, and they probably won't get it done next year. But if they can knock some key states off and some key players, some key organizations, it becomes a lot easier because everybody else just sat there like sheep and Watch the few sheep get picked off, and pretty soon there's more sheep, more wolves and coyotes than there is sheep. Yeah. So right now, I think it's all of the organizations combined, but if people would pay direct attention to the ones that are infiltrating government, the ones that know their legislators, the ones that are appointed to boards and committees, that gives you a pretty good eye-opening experience to figure out who's vulnerable and how how volatile the landscape is. Because what every state doesn't have is the same thing that every other state has. It's hard for me to preach to somebody, you know, in Virginia and say, you better help us with a mountain lion deal. And they're like, we we don't have mountain lions. I don't give a shit about mountain lions. I'm never going mountain lion hunting. Uh, But if you turn around and tell them the statutory definition and say, okay, take mountain lions out. What do you got back there? Why can't we put turkeys in there? How about raccoons? I mean, look at the dog part of it. Then they start to pay attention. They go, who are these groups? Well, who we have right now is Cats Aren't Trophies. The acronym is C-A-T-S. But we also have Wild Earth Guardians. We've got Defenders of Wildlife. We've got Prairie Protection. We've got Project Coyote, the Puma Project. You know, Center for Biological Diversity. You name it. And you look at some of these websites and, and you think, holy crap, they got like 90 organizations supporting this cause. Where the hell did all these... And it might be two old women that turn around and came up with a computer and a logo and, and you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but they're an organization and they, they got a tax status. And, and I think that that's where we've let our guard down because we haven't built alliances and, and allegiances to each other as quickly and formatively as what we should have. Yeah. And I'm a trapper. So, so anybody criticize, Oh, he's full of crap. Well, I'm, I'm a trapper. I've already lost a bunch of stuff that I don't want to see anybody else lose. Yeah. And I'm and I think that we have a roadmap that we can we can help prevent that, especially if they help us be victorious here on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I and I, I think a lot of people 
you know, the average person's like, well, what can I do? I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I can't be a Dan Gates or I can't, I just can't take on positions or be on committees or be on boards and, you know, but um, I think that educate yourself, obviously donate money, talk to your, your, your friends, people that, you know, yeah, uh, just, you know, just, just the conversation alone is huge. Just talking with whoever, you know, yeah. go out yeah. have a pizza and a beer with your friends. They're fishermen and you're a trapper. Let them know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you got to kind of be conscious of who, who you're talking about or talking to perspective wise, but how to engage them, you know, so all of that uh, it is pretty important. So, well, that's why, I mean, I could be open and frank with you guys because, you know, we're trappers. Sure. Um, and, 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 and we have to define ourselves. Do we belong in the conversation about the North American model? I believe so because there's so. provisions and, and there's specificity set aside for an exemption about fur bearing animals. Do we belong in the conversation about Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson? Well, from a sportsman perspective, we do because of the excise tax that we pay in for binoculars and waders and guns and ammo and archery and, and muzzleloading equipment and, and fishing equipment and so forth. But do we belong there from a trapping perspective? No. <laughs> and we don't really contribute from, from the excise tax of that side of it. I mean, should right. we have been all along? I don't know, but it would have gave us a little bigger – a bigger britches and maybe a bigger stool at the table. Yeah. Um, but we have to define who ourselves are. And, you know, look, there was a statement that was made by our adversaries here when asked, why would you go after these two different groups, trappers and houndsmen? And their statement, their answer was because we went after the low hanging fruit. And then we're going to go after and cut the branch off and then we're going to chop the tree down and then we're going to go into the forest. That's what they said. Yeah. Okay. If I'm the low hanging fruit, Charlie, and you're the low hanging fruit and they get rid of us, who's on the branch and they get rid of the branch. Who's on the tree. And I find that analogy pretty <laughs> ludicrous myself that they don't want us in the forest and they don't want us to cut any trees down, but they can use that, that cliche term. <laughs> that they can go cut the forest down because we're all part of the forest. Yeah. Uh, but, but if it was their forest, you can't touch it. Yeah. You, know, you can't, whether it's beetle killed and dead or fire stricken or whatever, you can't touch it. Yeah. And you know, so, but we have to utilize their intent and their intent is to wipe us out in some capacity, take the lowest hanging fruit, if somebody would define what state they live in and write down the lowest hanging fruit, okay, well, trappers are going to come into that and probably houndsmen in some capacity. Then what's it going to be? Archery? Is it going to be night hunting? Is it going to be other predator hunting? You know, is it going to be catch and release bird operations or is it going to be stocked fish? But you tell me what the lowest hanging fruit is in your state. And I could tell you that they're coming to your state as soon as they get rid of the lowest hanging fruit that they can get rid of. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's um, a good. It's a good analogy that they're this basically this parasite that feeds off of this emotional perspective that they're on. That's they can generate funds off of all of that, and and um, um, you know, at at our expense. Quite frankly, is kind of what it all comes down to. So it's uh, um, well, you know. And because you and I sit on the FTA board together, I mean, we can have these conversations, but, um, and maybe we should, but what does the FTA and NTA do to talk to the general public about conservation that encompasses everything? As soon as you and I go talk to somebody about trapping, oh my God, it's like you got the plague leprosy, you know, two-headed dragon coming up. But if you incorporate trapping into conservation that, that the general public can decipher, now we get to set the tone and the narrative because conservation, I, I said this to a, to a group of biologists, of almost 200 biologists, uh, which we've got 350 of them that work for our game agency here, but, but I got to do a presentation to them. And I said, when I stood up there, you know, these are PhD guys and, you know, they got a hell of a lot more smarts than I got, but I said, uh, how many people here trap? 
And like four people out of 200 held their hands up. And I said, well, what do you people do? <laughs> and they and they just kind of looked. And I said, I said, you were doing a crayfish study. You were doing a turtle study and a boreal toad study and a bat study and, and a mountain lion study and a deer, deer and elk study. Didn't you trap them? Well, not in the sense in the terms that you're talking about. Why? Why? I mean, have you not seen all the ancient tools that were used by the Neanderthals all the way up to the Native Americans and the mountain men and how we turn around and modify them to our current day? And we're still using similar mouse traps that we did 100 years ago. You know, they're still using cages. And what I find comical, because if you listen to most game agencies or you watch anything on, you know, the, the Discovery Channel or whatever the hell those shows are on, um, you listen to them. Well, the mountain lion came by our camera trap. <laughs> the mountain lion came by, you know, I'm thinking uh, it's a, it's a camera. Okay. Is it, it's not a camera trap, a trap <laughs> catches something. Okay. So, but, but they, but they even utilize the language because in their mind, they're trapping something. And I think that that's part of the education and conservation component that we can educate about because how many Turkey traps do you know that been going on where they went out and trapped turkeys, bighorn sheep, black footed ferrets. We just turned around and took, Swift Fox from Colorado and put him in Fort Belgrade up in Montana because they'd been extirpated up there or they died off or something. But we, but we trapped him here in cages and took him up there. Biologists and game wardens are trappers. Yeah. Homeowners are trappers. You know, quail and pheasant guys that turn around and do stuff are trappers. Plus, they all like trappers to be on the property because it gets rid of a lot of the vermin that eats a lot of their quail and their pheasants and their game birds. Sure. We, we all trap in some capacity. It's just a matter of, you know, I mean, I walked into a gal's house about three years ago and she, she, she didn't want anything harmed. Just, she, you couldn't, you could, you had to take the mice and you had to put them outside. Well, that's going to cost more. And so I start looking around the house about potential entrances and exits and stuff and trying to find, you know, food sources or whatever. And I just asked her, I, I walked through the kitchen and I said, do you mind me asking why you don't want me? to trap something. And she said, well, I think it's inhumane. And I looked over in the window and there's a giant fly strip coming down in the corner of the window. <laughs> and there was a bunch of flies and a Miller moth on there. And the Miller moth was sitting there doing this. I said, so where do you draw the line? And she kind of laughed at me and she says, you're an ass. You know that? <laughs> I said, I'm just asking. I mean, you got a glue trap here for insects, but you already drew the line about the difference between insects and rodents. So you're going to draw the line between rodents and coyotes because everybody's got a breaking point. And she said, are you telling me the only way you can solve this problem is, is with traps? And I said, the only way I can solve it economically feasibly is with traps. And she said, well, give me the price of the, each one that you're talking about. And I said, if I do this, it's going to cost X amount. And I think it was about half as much or a third as much if I was going to turn around and use kill traps and, and glue boards and some bait stations and stuff. But but the but my point is that we have to educate. She didn't see it, that as her trapping. She was still trapping. And biologists didn't see it as them trapping, even though they were on a bighorn sheep or an otter study or whatever the hell. Right. And I think that we need to figure out a way to convince what we do as part of the norm, because that's part of human interaction with wildlife and conservation and society. And most people don't think about that. Yeah. And there's an opportunity that I think we missed out on from a trapping perspective, but think how broad that opportunity is missed out on the conservation perspective. Yep. About the Rocky Mountain Elk, the National the Rocky Mountain Bighorn, the National Wild Turkey Federation. They're talking to the members more than they're talking to the public, and what public they're talking to very well might be a member that just doesn't hunt. Yeah. So we're yeah. we're gonna we're we're gonna build that roadmap, and we're gonna turn around and try to convince people. And maybe I'll be dead and gone by the by the time people adhere to it, but they won't be able to say that we lost and didn't give them the keys to the roadmap, uh, the keys to the treasure chest, because it's it's gonna be there, and we've got a hell of a supporting cast and crew nationwide that's that's willing to help support that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's key, and it, and it's a good point that you know the FTA and the NTA certainly we're all really good at talking within amongst ourselves, but we're not particularly good at, you know, the word outside of that. So. But, um... No. And, and I apologize. I, I got to say to the trapping public, I'm a board member of each one of those. And the, and the, while I think that I provide a value, I'm not as good as what I 
once was that Toby Keith song, you know, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, uh, I have fallen off of both of those things to some degree and still participate, but not at the level that I was. Cause we're getting our ass handed to us in Colorado. Well, you've taken off a, a much bigger, uh, in my view, um, immediately important role for sure. So I, it, uh, you weren't the last board meeting, so I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I haven't been to the last two conventions because, and, and ironically, because all the crap comes out at the same time, and uh, and now we're just up to our ass and elbows and with alligators. I mean, it's just we got them running everywhere, and and uh, and I'm not an alligator trapper, and I don't wrestle them very well. But I tell you what, uh, there's if we if we provide as much information as what we possibly can to the trapping community based upon our successes here uh taking that victory and say we know this works we know the funding works we know the messaging works work with the experts that are doing all the other stuff and co-mingle that to put it in one pot yeah because what i don't agree with is some of the the organizations or the the study groups or whatever saying what will work but haven't ever implemented it Wildlife management has to be adaptive and you have to be nimble. But if you're going to fight for conservation and wildlife management, you better be a hell of a lot more prepared and adaptive and nimble. And I say a hell of a lot more prepared because the, the, the game agencies have a funding mechanism that comes in because people buy licenses and you have Dingle Johnson and Pittman Robertson excise taxes to be able to fund those agencies. But the agencies, more than not, can't say or speak the facts because different administrations won't allow them to do so. Yeah. Some administrations will, but don't take that for granted because here we used to be able to have that too. Wyoming used to be able to have that. Montana used to be able to have that. That, that doesn't mean it's written in stone. If yeah. the governor decides you're not going to talk about it, well, I got you're not going to talk about it. Yeah. We need to build an armament for messaging and education to the general public in cohesive parallel movement with our partners in conservation yeah. with the other groups that we're all members of. And I really honestly believe that. And it sounds like I'm, you know, lay, laying a line of BS out there, but it's, it's trying to get people to talk to talk and walk the walk and figure out how we do it collectively, collaboratively, and look at each other as our advocates and look across the river at the adversaries. We are not each other's adversaries. It's our model. It's our mission. We need to turn around and adhere to it. And if we don't do that, it doesn't matter how many kids we get involved. It doesn't matter how many things we do positively on the landscape. Nobody will care because we'll become smaller and smaller and smaller. And I'm not just talking about the trapping side of it. I'm talking about the entire conservation side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't, I'll be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> You're going to race all this and then you'll never have me back. See, well, we, we were going to have Dan Gates on, but he never would call us back. So, <laughs> no, I, I, This is probably realistically one of the most important podcasts we've ever done. We've been doing them for several years. And, and it, if it's not the, it's probably the most important. I, I, I think, um, you're a great, uh, advocate and spokesman for this, Dan. I, I, um, I'm sure everyone uh, listening to this appreciates what you guys are doing. Once again, um, you got you got any final thoughts um, that you want to say? You, your final thought, just your your thoughts, just a minute ago, were were really good, and that uh, <laughs> served the it's purpose quite well. So, but. well, yeah, you, you know, I, I I said this a long time that I, I've got a weak mind, strong back, broad shoulders, and a big flipping mouth. So <laughs> sometimes sometimes people has to get me to tell me to shut up. The thing that I would say is. Uh, don't take what we do for granted. Don't take what we strive to support and defend for granted. If people don't know what district that they live in and who their elected officials are, they better find out. And if they're not registered to vote, they better register to vote to find out. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to be a political advocate or a road scholar when it comes to politics. I'm saying that people make decisions on our behalf, whether we vote for them or not. And if they don't know who you are, if they don't know that you own a business and that you are a constituent in their district, there's no way, shape or form they can represent you. And there's an opportunity for us 
to commingle those efforts collectively to make sure that our voices are heard, they're recognized by the people that are in office. And it sounds like an insurmountable task, but let me explain something. Every state's got 65, roughly 65 representatives and 35 senators, or there's 100 of them in somewhere. On a national level, it's a little bit different than that. If you can't take the time to talk to your game commission, whether there's five of them or 11 of them, or at least know who they are, and if you can't take the time to recognize who your particular senators or representatives are, somebody else is doing that for you. And more often than not, they have intended, ill-intentioned consequences. Mm -hmm. Sportsmen and women just want to go out and hunt. They want to trap. They want to put all the time in and sign up for their licenses. They want to look at all the graphs and the data and the statistics and plan their attack of where they're going to go and when they're going to go and how this season overlaps with that one and how many preference points they got and how they can turn around and start trapping on one side of the one side of the state when they just got done deer hunting on the other side of the state. If we would take eight hours a year per sportsman and women, eight hours a year and divide that up into dealing with the people that are making the decisions, whether it's the commissioners, whether it's the legislators, whether it's the game managers, eight hours per year, we would be undeniably the most formidable force on the planet when it came to fighting for our rights and privileges. Eight hours a year. I know guys that are spending eight hours a week on license applications right now, trying to figure out when, where, how, how to do it. Yeah. They spend more time doing that than they do. And I say, look, we got a big hearing on Wednesday at the Capitol. Can you go? No, no, I can't go do that. <laughs> you know, I can't, but you'll spend time doing all this other stuff. And I think if we could convince ourselves and we could start talking that and we could start walking that, you would see a movement that was created just like what we're observing here, where we have hundreds of thousands of people from around the country that are stepping up to say, not only am I going to pay, I'm going to help play. I want to make sure that we have this in sustainable levels in perpetuity. And I think that in a final word, Charlie, you can say aim small, miss small. You can stay, stay the course. You could say anything that you want, but it doesn't matter if we can't adhere to what was established by our predecessors, by our founding fathers in conservation. They put us where we're at today. Who's going to put the people in the future where they're at? Is it going to be us or is it going to be somebody else from the animal rights community? Yeah. Well, and one more one more time for the cost of a box of ammunition. Yep. <laughs> Or for Box those of ammunition, savethehuntcolorado.com. Yep, and if uh, for those of you that want to kick in a little bit more, it's the cost of a good pair of boots or a good pair of a good jacket or a, a rifle or whatever. So um, it's it's a small pay, price to pay for um, something this important. So I know I know a lot of people that sold a lot of their fur this year for three hundred and fifty bucks total or thirteen hundred dollars total, and I know that goes right back in so they can go lose more money the next year. So we can get more stuff tanned and we could, Hey, I'm one of those guys. I mean, look at all the crap piled behind me back here. I got more furs and fur hats and I know what to do with. And I do this crap for a living. We have the opportunity to set our flag and everybody can be part of the victory or they can sit and watch and be part of the defeat. And I don't think that's going to be the case when it comes down to it. And I really think that when other States recognize what we created, everybody's going to want to be part of that successful bandwagon the cost of a box of ammo three lattes or four boxes of donuts or a 7-Eleven burrito, maybe a half a tank of gas, whatever. We have to figure out a way to help each other out. And we're just asking for everybody else's support at this point in time. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, we, thank you, Dan. We, we appreciate, appreciate Dan. Yeah. What you're doing and everything. You... So we, we didn't, mean, everybody... didn't mean it to be a Debbie Downer here. So no, you're good. I think, <laughs> I think the outcome is going to be very positive. So yeah, um, very important. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, we'll be in touch.